What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hey, good to see you. Man, this is, today is a, is a great day. Um, we, not only do we have an awesome guest, but uh, I'm, I'm reporting live from uh, Joint Base San Antonio, where we just opened up a, a beautiful new store at Fort Sam Houston. So uh, the folks here are, are, are amazing. The, the staff is amazing. The community is, was really excited. And it was, it, it, we opened the floodgates, man. And they, they, they ran through that, that the, the, was that the ribbon, ribbon cutting situations. Yep. Awesome. Uh oh! Well, congrats, congratulations! I know the community was excited about that new shopping center, first one uh, at Fort Sam, uh, first new one in like fifty years, I think. So long overdue. Yeah. So congratulations! So glad you got to be there. Absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, but we obviously uh, have a thing for Marines on Chief Chat because uh, <laughs> we we've had a ton of guests that have served in the Corps, including myself. Uh, so our next guest is an amazing Devil Dog that has an amazing story about resiliency. So without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Hey, you got it, Chief. Today's guest is a Purple Heart recipient who served as a Marine for eight years, he deployed to Afghanistan. And during his time in the war, he found his faithful companion who became his lifeline, a dog he named Fred. His first book, uh, the memoir, Craig and Fred, a Marine, a stray dog, and how they rescued each other, that told of their unlikely journey. But he's with us today to discuss his new book, Second Chances, a Marine, his dog, and finding redemption. And the book hit shelves this week and great news, you can find it at your exchange and shopmyexchange.com. Please help us give a warm chief chat welcome to Craig Grossi. Hey. Oh, thank, thank you so much for, for having us on this. Uh, Fred is obviously thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, this Fred. is really great. It's a really, really awesome opportunity. I appreciate, I appreciate being with you guys. Well, Craig and Fred, thanks so much for joining us. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Leave your questions and comments for Craig there too. We'll read those live. Now is a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page well, you should. Chief Chats are every, every week and we have terrific military guests lined up for you all spring and even summer. Awesome. So Craig, man, it's, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you with us today on Chief Chat. Uh, we, 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 uh, can you let the audience know where you come to us from today and how you've been faring during the pandemic? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we're coming to you from Maine. Uh, we, we've uh, made, made our home in Maine over the last couple of years. And I'm originally from the Northern Virginia, uh, you know, uh, DC area, um, but really fell in love with Maine when I, we, we came up here so I could finish my first book, Craig and Fred. And we, we, we never left. <laughs> uh, so it's, you know, it's really been, uh, been a, a really great journey to, to kind of end up up here. And, um, and in terms of the pandemic, you know, I've absolutely just been so blessed and so grateful um, that uh, we're, we've, we've stayed healthy and, and our families have, have as well. It's been, you know, we're really counting our blessings for sure. Absolutely. Terrific. Glad, glad to hear that you guys are well. And um, I'm so glad that Fred could join us too. I wasn't positive that he was going to be part of the interview, but I'm really glad. I'm really glad he's here too. Um, he should have some great things to say. So, <laughs> so. Snoring right now. I don't know if you can hear him snoring a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So we would also like to kind of start off hearing a little bit about your military career. What led you to join the military and why the Marines? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's always kind of funny to look back on, on, on that part of, I think, you know, your journey as a, as a service person. And um, for me, it was, you know, we, my dad was in the Air Force actually for four years after high school and he served overseas and, um, and but we weren't a military family per se, but growing up in the DC area, all of my, my neighbors were either active military or former military you know, the, the whole area kind of around DC, everyone's kind of working um, either for the government or like in service of something, you know, so it was kind of instilled in me, I think at an early age, the idea of serving my country, um, you know, and then when it came to the, to the Marine Corps, I, you know, I was really drawn to it um, out of, out of 
an idea of just, you know, being really, if I was going to dedicate my life to something, I really wanted to, it to be a, an, an environment that would demand kind of the best from me. And what really, what really hooked me was uh, they had a, uh, you know, like a career day where they had all the different branches come in and give a presentation at my high school. I think it was actually like my junior year. So I, I wasn't even really, you know, thinking that, that much ahead, but I'll never forget this when each branch got up and gave a presentation, they all, they had a slideshow, they had some, you know, t-shirts they were throwing out to the kids and stuff in the, in the auditorium. And the last, the last branch to come up and give their presentation was a Marine recruiter. And, you know, he was of course impressive in his dress blues and all that. And he got up there, but he didn't, it was more about what he didn't say or didn't have. He just got up there and he didn't have a slideshow. He didn't have any t-shirts to toss. Um, you know, he just kind of looked around the auditorium and was like, you know, maybe three or four of you have what it takes to be a Marine. If you think you're one of them, come talk to me. He got, and he left. <laughs> oh wow Up to Man. yeah and like that it was like boom it nailed me um and i laugh really hard about it now because you know knowing what i know about the, about recruiters and that process like something tells me that 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 uh that 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 was just kind of one of it like maybe he was late for another thing you know or he yeah. you know like they, they didn't give him enough time and that was his little hip pocket thing that he just threw out there uh to see if there were any any suckers but that you know that was me got me <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's awesome. And so for me, you know, I think, I think mine had a t-shirt. So I think, I think when uh, the Marine <laughs> recruiter came to my high school, uh, he, he probably had the same, like, uh, drop the mic type speech. Uh, I don't even remember, <laughs> but I definitely remember getting a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, I have to ask, um, well, if you grew up in Virginia, you probably went to Paris Island, right? right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's Paris Island guy. I went, I went in, uh, March of 03. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we, you know, we always had that that friendly because I, you know, I'm a Hollywood Marine and, right, right. and we used to talk up, <laughs> you know, everybody from Paris Island, all they have to, to, to show for it is some sand fleas or some some itches, some bumps or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. And we had those those mountains in California that we had to deal with. Yeah, but you guys, yeah, you guys get to hang out at a Padres game though and eat hot dogs. So that's <laughs> 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 That's the old back and forth there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I, always felt, I always felt for the, for the, the Marines out, out West that, that, that you had to watch those planes taking off all the time. That would have been oh. nuts. So, so funny story. I know we're probably off track, but uh, <laughs> I, I get to San Diego, right? Get off the plane. They put us in this bus and they, they tell us to put our head between our legs on the school bus. So I'm a, I'm a tall guy. So me trying to get my head between my legs is probably... It, it's very uncomfortable, but uh, I always wonder, like, why did y'all want us to put our heads between our legs while they drive? They like, they, we don't want you to memorize the path back to the airport, uh -huh. right? Because <laughs> <laughs> so, because they would they would have occasional Marines that uh, somehow get off get off base yeah. and they make it in the airport, but you can tell because they got tennis shoes on with with right. with AB with uh with with camis, so you. <laughs> you know you're a marine and they call the drill instructors and like hey we got another one at the airport uh here you go but yeah it it was uh quite depressing uh to see those planes take off every single day and you wishing you were on one. Oh man yeah i bet yeah <laughs> fun stuff um so craig the exchange met you a few years ago you came to our annual managers conference to share your incredible journey with fred Today, we'd like you to reintroduce us to Fred. How did you meet him and what makes him so special? Yeah, that's great. Um, that, was, that was a lot of fun, that, that manager's conference. We had a great time uh, telling our story there with, with all of you. And, um, so yeah, in our, it's a, the, the story is um, told in my, my first book, Craig and Fred, I actually have a couple here. Um, and we're really lucky to have a young reader version and a regular adult version of the book, which is really cool. Um, but, uh, I found, I found Fred, uh, in a really unlikely place in Afghanistan. I mean, we all have everybody that's been overseas. We've seen the, the dogs that can kind of gravitate towards fobs and, and bases and stuff. And it's, it's a pretty common thing to, to develop a relationship, you know, for, if you're over there, um, but what makes Fred's, you know, a little more special, a little more kind of unlikely is that I was an intelligence collector attached to reconnaissance Marines. And we inserted into Sangin, Fred's hometown. Um, and it, there was no base. There was nobody waiting for us. Like there was no real established troop presence into the area of Sangin that we were going. 
And so we kind of landed on Fred. We came in out of the back of helicopters and we, uh, we found an abandoned compound and we fortified it overnight. Um, you know, just kind of had to make our own little base right there. And that happened to be where Fred had kind of had kind of ended up. And that first week in Sangin, uh, you know, we were just really holding on for dear life. And, and uh, the, uh, that was when I really saw just the incredible uh, bravery and professionalism um, of recon Marines and how we helped, we were, we were able to hold that ground um, from a, a numerically superior uh, Taliban uh, there in Sangin. And in between, you know, battles, in between gunfights, I, I'd be getting some water and, and um, you know, cleaning my weapon and stuff. And, and I'd see, I'd see this dog, I'd see this funny little stray kind of like trotting around the, the battle space like he was the mayor, you know, and it was just so funny. <laughs> It would be hot. It was hot as heck, you know, and, and you usually didn't see dogs out and about during the day like that. They would usually come out at night, but, and he was a loner. He was all by himself, but like he, he just had this real kind of like light about him. I swear he was like glowing and he would just make me smile. And we would always kind of take a look at him and it would just, just looking at him would make us, would make us smile. And after that first week, things kind of calmed down and, um, you know, we were able to start planning some patrols and, and I was able to do my thing as an, as an human intelligence collector to, start engaging with locals and, um, and, and, um, and stuff like that. And, and that was when I really, you know, got a good look at him. And, and uh, there was one day things were kind of calm and I, and I had, I took it upon myself to grab a piece of beef jerky and, and walk kind of towards Fred. And, and as I got closer, I almost, I almost turned around because he was covered in bugs. Um, you know, his fur was matted. He was not the, uh. the well-fed glorious boy you see here before you. He was in <laughs> shape and, and, uh, what kept me going was I saw his tail start to wag, you know, and, and that, that, you know, just opened my heart and brought me a little closer. Cause this guy had, he had nothing to wag his tail about, um, you know, and, and it brought me closer and I, I gave him that first piece of jerky and, and we've been on an adventure <laughs> ever yeah. since. Yeah. Love it. Jerky. <laughs> I, I go back to those first moments with Fred all the time, you know, and, and throughout my writing process and throughout the story and throughout my life, the, 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 the fact that he wagged his tail has been a lesson that I've needed to remind myself of and, and continue to, to learn throughout my life. You know, just that the, how far you can go in life when you find a reason to, to wag your tail. He's a, he's a true example of that. Oh, I, that's such a nice thought. I like, I like that. I'm going to keep that with me. That's, that's good stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. For me, for me, um, that's, that's an awesome, uh, story and an awesome way to kind of, um, you know, I, I could be going through the worst conditions, but like you say, I find a reason to, to see the, see the, the goodness and everything, but I'm trying to figure out like how did Fred make it back to the United States? Like, uh, uh, I, 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 could, I don't know if I can even bring stuff through customs and stuff. And so <laughs> beef jerk, I don't even think the beef jerky can get through customs. <laughs> I mean, it, took, it took every ounce of my, of my spooky, uh, intelligence, uh, you know, resourcefulness to, to make that happen. And a lot of luck, to be completely honest. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was definitely, uh, you know, it could have gone wrong at any moment. And uh, it's kind of fun to hear from, from people that have read Craig and Fred that even though, you know, it's obvious that he makes it back, he's on the cover of the book, you know, and uh, it, it, people still get uh, anxiety reading the story because there's so many moments where it, it could have mm -hmm. gone wrong, you know, and, they, and they'll have to stop every once in a while and like look at the cover and be like, hey, <laughs> back. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, your, so your, your, uh, your first book, Craig and Fred, highlighted your story of hope and the power of stubborn positivity. So that's a, that, that's a good catchphrase, absolutely. So uh, it garnered tremendous national attention. So what was that like for you when you kind of made it big? Yeah, that was, that was wild, uh, to be honest. I, I, you know, for me, the story was became kind of like something that was like kind of burning in, inside me. And I really realized it took me a while, uh, but the more I told it, just walking Fred around DC and then on a road trip, I went on um, one summer uh, before going back to school uh, for my last year at school, um, it became more and more clear to me that, that the fact that I had, I had made it home after, um, after coming so close, um, you know, um, with my, my purple heart and, and the, the, the rocket that almost took me out. And the fact that Fred made it back, you know, in one piece without getting caught, um, you know, that was 
became so obvious to me the more I told it and the more I wrote it out to, for myself um, that, you know, just, just it became kind of my, my mission to get the story out there however I could. And so when I got the opportunity to write a book for a major publisher like, like William Morrow and, and Harper Collins, um, that was incredible. And then to see the reception that it's gotten uh, year after year just continues to gain popularity in schools and communities and, and places all over our country and all over the world. And, and that, that has defied uh, my mission statement, my expectations, you know, uh, tenfold. Um, and it's just been, I, I think, a testament to all of us and all of us and what we are really looking for in the world and, and you know, the kind of stories and the kind of examples, uh, you know, that we're, we're really searching for, uh, especially these, these days. So were you, were you always a writer or, or someone that um, was that was that always like a passion of yours, even while you were in or just growing up? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I always say, you know, writing was the first and maybe the only thing I was ever really good at in, in school. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if it was a writing assignment that really, you know, didn't have a lot of um, left and right lateral limits, I could, I could really shine, you know, and just, and I, I've always felt comfortable expressing myself, um, spoke speaking and, and, and especially writing. Um, and, but I think I lost, uh, to be honest, I lost touch with that. I lost touch with that side of myself um, through, you know, eight years in the Marines and uh, a lot of trauma that comes with combat and coming home from combat and losing friends. And um, I, I really kind of pushed my own kind of individuality and, and that and, and creativity kind of down um, and kind of we're always going to be the first ones to talk ourselves out of out of anything like that and I did that for a long time um, and so it, it took it, that's I you know that we always hear about dogs how you know you rescue them once and they rescue you you know countless times and and that is certainly true of Fred and, and our story and just him being himself uh, and kind of almost forcing me to smoke sorry <laughs> oh, he's dreaming a little bit too. It's positive. Um, <laughs> even of course, walking him around DC, people would just come up and be like, "What kind of dog is he? He's so interesting, you know, and, and so funny and engaging, and just the way he moved, kind of draws people in." And you guys saw him at the conference, like on stage. He's just a character, and and it kind of really, it really forced me to tell the story and, and verbally first. And the more I told it, the more I kind of that side of me kind of kind, kind of came back. And, um, and then finally, uh, after going back to school and having to write papers and stuff at, at school, it kind of, the two kind of sides came together and I really reconnected with that, that kid and me, the writer in me. Uh, and I, I haven't slowed down since. I, I still love to write. I'm gonna do, gonna do a third book. We're gonna keep it going. Oh, that's exciting. Awesome. And then speaking of books, so the next chapter for you and Fred is told through your new book, uh, Second Chances. Yeah. Congratulations on the new title. Our, our viewers Absolutely. can find it at shopmyexchange.com. So can you share with us a little bit about the book and the work that you and Fred have done in the service dog training program at Maine State Prison? Of course, yes. Yeah. So we're so proud and so excited about, about Second Chances. Um, and it really is it really is born from Craig and Fred, like the, the speaking opportunities that we got from the first book kind of led me to, to Maine State Prison, uh, which is uh, otherwise known as, as uh, Shawshank, uh, which is yeah. the prison that was made by Stephen King's mm -hmm. uh, book and, and the movie. Mm -hmm. um, that, the original facility was torn down back in 2000, but it's still kind of, you know, got that allure to it and that kind of vibe. Um, and so uh, Fred and I went up there to, to because of, uh, because of, the, the warden at the time, uh, he's an army veteran, an, an Iraq war veteran, and his name is Randy Liberty, which is like the coolest. Name. It is a cool name. <laughs> and, uh, and so Fred and I went up to share our story with his staff. And then he has in, in the facility, he has a, a cell block, a pod is what we, we call him, um, of, that's designated for, for former service members, for veterans. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to come in and, and uh, meet with the book club and meet with the with veterans that are incarcerated. And, you know, I, I, I spent my first four years working as a corrections uh, Marine, uh, military police corrections. And, and so I'm very comfortable in a prison, but I had my own kind of things that I, I was expecting from, from the facility and from the men inside. And, and all my expectations were kind of just thrown right out the door very quickly. 
And I realized that the culture and the, the kind of community that was really within that place was very special. And, and I felt instantly kind of drawn to just kind of go back as often as I could. And so in between speaking engagements and travels with Fred across the country, anytime we would come back to Maine, I would hit up Randy on, on you know, Randy Liberty on via email and be like, hey, I want to come up and, and see the guys. He's like, yep, come on up. And so I just started, I just started spending my free time up there and and uh, and really just kind of fell in love with with um, with the, the the environment. And one of the things that that really drew me in was the was the dogs. Um, America's Vet Dogs is, is an incredible nonprofit uh, that provides highly highly trained service dogs for for our veterans, and they entrust the first 18, 15 to eighteen months of those dogs' uh, lives to to men uh, and, and women, in, in some cases behind bars, uh, to give them the bedrock uh, and, uh, and fundamentals of, of the training that that uh, that they really need to be um, really high caliber service dogs and that was an incredible thing for me to just hear and then I started spending time in the classes and, and, and kind of monitoring and kind of um, recording you know it, it, through my notes the training process and what it really takes to to train a, a, a service dog to take a little puppy like that and, and in the course of less than you know a year and a half, um, turn it into like essentially, a, you know, an, a, you know, a, a real uh, lifesaver for, for, for someone. It's an incredible process to, to kind of witness. And I'm really proud to, to share, to share that in second chances. Wow. Um, and that's, but that's awesome that you, you, uh, you, you go back to that community. I think sometimes when people are, are behind bars, uh, people kind of write them off at, and, and, and they just don't really kind of understand the, the trauma or the PTSD that they've had throughout their lives that, that kind of led them down that, that path. So you, you know, you taking time and, and, and also, you know, having, you know, teaming up with the canines to, to have some support dogs. Cause uh, those, those, those men and women are behind bars, man. They, they're humans too. And, and they need help and they, they need to someone to, to, to care about them as well. So I, mm -hmm. I admire you for that. I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, it, I think a lot of things kind of drew me in and, and one of the one of the one of the things that I explore in second chances is is the fact that I discovered very quickly how little actually separated me from from those men that I came to to know in, in prison you know and, and and most of the things that that separates us are out of my control you know they had they had to do with with the zip code I was born into and, and the, the, the bubble that I was kind of allowed to make mistakes in when I came home from, from Afghanistan. You know, a lot of our veterans, a lot of people don't have that opportunity to make mistakes and to get second chances. And they get very quickly kind of caught up into this system that in, in my opinion needs, you know, needs some attention. We need to have conversations about what we're really doing to, to people when we lock them up, you know, and, and really, um, the, the walls that we continue to put in place even after they're out, you know, which is, it's, uh, we need to really start thinking, rethinking, I think, uh, that process. And can you share how are both disabled veterans and inmates experiencing um, renewal and redemption? What, what can you share with us about that, Craig? Yeah, of course. So, uh, I mean, the, I've learned a lot about the, the dog human bond. Fred and I's bond is, is, is really strong, of course, and, and um, but what I think is really incredible to watch is that bond be really uh, engineered and and the, the absolute most really be pulled out of it through training and through uh, like really positive reinforcement that these that the the inmate trainers do with these with these labs from America's Vet Dogs. They really uh, are just really professional about. Um, Kind of using that bond for the real benefit of, of the person that's going to end up receiving that dog. Um, and it's kind of heartbreaking because in order to do that, the inmate really has to get very, very close to that mm -hmm. dog. And they, they form that bond over the course of the training process. And then it has to be severed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the, but the inmates receive training, you know, in, in dog training, they learn how to, how to be a dog trainer. And, and a lot of them now are certified um, by the Department of Labor in dog training. Uh, they get their like 2000 hour certification through that process. And, and so they get, you know, life experience in dog training and, and uh, they get that, you know, 
a lot of them have described it to me as, as, as in when they're working with the dog, it's very similar to those moments that I spent with Fred in Afghanistan when he would just come over and hang out with my fellow Marines and I, you know, we weren't thousands of miles away from home in a, in a war zone. We were just a couple, bunch of guys with a dog, you know, and he really <laughs> elevated us, for, even if it's just for a couple of minutes from the stress of that battlefield. And these dogs do something similar for the men in, in Maine State Prison, where when they're working with them and when they're interacting with them and, and training them, they're, they're not, you know, mentally and, and their hearts aren't really behind bars and mm -hmm. and then the peace of mind that and the purpose that it gives them to know that that dog is going to then go on to a veteran and that it, it, that really needs it that really needs that 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 freedom that comes with having a service dog you know because it's so much of of our so many of our veterans have mobility issues and and, and severe post-traumatic stress you know that really limits their their you know their daily activities you know and then they get they get to have that dog that can open up doors for them and, and give them freedom um you know that they lost as a result of, of of fighting for hours which is a beautiful thing absolutely so so Corey, what what lessons are you hoping our readers uh take away from second chances yeah that's a great question i you know i um <laughs> somebody just kicked me <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, I, I'm, I'm most interested in what people tell, like, take away from it. I, I didn't write Craig and Fred and I didn't write Second Chances with any kind of a, an agenda or any kind of one message that I'm really trying to get out. Uh, there are, th like, I hope that people, if nothing else, come away with like, like what you said, Chief, like really like a more kind of human, like understanding of, of, of the people that we have million I mean, we have millions and millions of our fellow americans behind bars and it's time that we really start to see them as our fellow americans as our fellow humans and and, and really addressing the the issues that they're re-entering society with as a result of their in, uh, incarceration um so i hope that if nothing else we can kind of start that conversation um through this book um but i'm most interested in and in, you know just what people what people take away from it um on their own, you know, just from picking it up and reading it and, and what, you know, the lessons that they, that they learn. And when you're not writing, you and Fred are involved with veterans organizations. Can you tell us about your work with USA Warriors Ice Hockey and then Canines on the Front Lines and, and then any other uh, organizations that y'all might be involved with? Yeah, yeah, so I, I've, I've you know, I'm really an advocate um, for both of those programs and uh, USA Warriors um, really kind of, uh, hockey has been a part of my life since I was very young. It's like, um, my, my, it's more than a game to me. I love, I love the sport. <laughs> and when I came back from Afghanistan, when I got out of the Marines, it, I, um, you know, I, I was a little hesitant to get back on the ice. It had been a long time since I played and it gave the USA Warriors kind of encouraged me to to get back out there and play, and and it really inspired me because what I saw was um, men and women who some of them had never played hockey before. Mm -hmm. They were at Walter Reed or Bethesda with some, some of them pretty severe injuries, missing limbs or you know or different parts of their of their bodies coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're deciding to play hockey, you know. As, <laughs> as their sport. And I'm kidding, like of all the things you could you know, take up it, and like having never played hockey before, before their injury, then deciding to play hockey was like, wow, so, you know, if they can do it, I should get back out there. I should get back on the ice. And, and, uh, and I was really a, a beneficiary of, of USA Warriors. So I try to, to advocate for that program as much as I can. And, and, um, and they have a sled, a sled hockey program. If you've never seen sled hockey, you need to look up the sled hockey. Oh, wow. They, they uh, I think two of the gold medal, two, two members of the gold medal team from the last Olympics uh, were, were um, got their start in the USA Warriors hockey program. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. And uh, it's an incredible sport to watch. They're so physical. <laughs> and, uh, and it's so, you know, it's really near and dear to my heart. And I try to, to get the word out about that however I can. And, and Canines on the Front Lines is, is a, a local main um uh, organization that's run run by some awesome people that we've grown really close to over the years. Uh, one of them is Chris Tilly's a former former Navy SEAL, um, and they um, they take rescue dogs and mm -hmm. together with local um, uh, canine police officers, they give 
uh, veterans and the, these rescue dogs the training to become like a, a team like a, a part like kind of really again going back to that bond and, the, and and really focusing on the training that kind of enhances that bond um, and so it's a really kind of cool process that you know involves local local law enforcement veterans and these awesome rescue dogs and, and it's really just a beautiful thing to, to watch so again I just I try to advocate um, for them however I can we you know we, we share share their, what they're doing on social media on Fred's pages and and we'd like to go and, and uh, you know, just kind of talk about, about their, their process. It's really cool. Well, well for, for a hockey player, man, you got a good set of teeth still, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she. <laughs> I had, my, my front two are, uh, are there's little, little caps on them. Yeah, they're, 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 not, they're not, not all original. <laughs> Call it an <laughs> out. <laughs> no, listen, I've, I've, I've watched hockey for a long time and, and, and and teeth is are optional when it comes to playing <laughs> hockey. <laughs> Who's your team? Do you have a favorite team? Uh, caps, caps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Big caps fan. Yeah. You the follow time. college too, or just the pros? A little college. Yeah, that, it was really cool. Was, uh, uh, UMass just won the frozen the frozen four this year, and that's where my fiance went to school. So that was pretty fun to watch them win. Yeah. Oh, awesome. fiance! So you're getting hitched soon? Yeah, I'm getting hitched soon. Yeah, that's that's the plan. Yeah. Awesome. When's the, can you share when the, yeah, congrats. When's the, when's the big day? Yeah, it'll be at the, at the end of the summer. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's exciting. I'm excited about it. Terrific. Well, Craig, we have soldiers, airmen, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members tuning in from all over the world. And as a veteran and a Purple Heart recipient, what message of hope and encouragement would you like to share with them today? Yeah, of course. I think, um, you know, I, again, I just going back to those first moments with Fred, you know, and thinking about the fact that he wagged his tail when he had every reason to growl and to raise his fur and to try to get me to leave him alone. You know, the fact that he wagged his tail at me, uh, it, you know, it, it made all the difference in the world in his life, uh, you know, and it has in mine as well. Um, so, he, you know, I hope that uh, no matter what our, 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 uh, our uniform people are facing, um, overseas or, or at home or, or whether they're in or out, um, you know, that we can, you know, start each day and start each moment and start each interaction with, with gratitude and, and with a little wag of the tail, um, you know, because everything kind of can fall into place um, a after that. Awesome. Awesome. So um, besides second chances, what, what's ahead for you and Fred? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see, you know, lots of, lots to, um, lots to talk about, lots to, uh, to do, you know, the book just came out this week. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we can continue to travel in the coming months as the country kind of uh, reopens uh, safely, of course. Um, you know, we really miss, miss engaging with people in person, at, you know, across the country. It's, it's one of our favorite things to do, but we've grown, we've grown accustomed to the, to the Zoom lifestyle, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's, it, it, there's, there's some, some perks to that as well, just not, not having to, to pack up and travel, but um, so we'll see, you know, we'll see what, what's coming in the coming, the coming months. Um, but we're really, really excited and really grateful for this opportunity to publish another book and, and to be here today with, with, with you awesome people. It's really, really, really great. Well, and then speaking of the Zoom lifestyle, we have viewers tuning in from all over the world. And I want to just pause for a minute to kind of look at the live feed and then share some of the comments with you. Awesome. So we have, um, so we have Carla, she says, greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Army, family and MWR programs, they're watching with us. And I believe that they shared the feed to their page and they said, um, hi, and that they'll be sharing the feed to their page. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I know there's some other comments. Um, Celia Anthony says she's watching from Waldorf, Maryland. And Stephanie is also watching from Fort Meade. Um, Army Family, M Family MWR says congratulations on the book. Um, Carmen is watching from Cleveland. Let's see. I, I know that there's a couple questions down in here. I just need to get to them. Um, Let's see. Then some, somebody's watching from Italy. Uh, wow. Lily says she ordered the first book. If you ever come to California, you got to sign it for her. Um, <laughs> Martin's watching from Poland. So that's exciting. And then we do have a question again from Army Family MWR programs. And I have to get back to it. I'm so sorry. I just, okay. He says, what is Fred's favorite 
dog food or does he eat a special diet? He looks really healthy and content. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he I mean, his favorite dog food, he eats well. He eats very well. <laughs> he, we're, we're on the raw, on the raw diet. Um, we, we don't make it ourselves. We buy like a, a packaged raw. Um, that's pretty bougie. When you look at the ingredients list, it's like, <laughs> right? you know, <laughs> um, pretty bougie. Yeah, he gets like goat's milk in the morning, and he gets. Oh. Yeah, it's uh the the wow. lifestyle. It's, it's the least he's like, well taken care of. Uh, but he loves uh you know his favorite food is he's got a real sweet tooth which cracks me up. Um, he loves donuts. <laughs> he loves like you know do- he loves donuts. He loves donuts. Yeah. He, you give him donuts. <laughs> well, surprises sometimes. So just all of a sudden, just decide he really wants something like Nora made uh um like pumpkin muffins one time and we were just sitting out on the porch having these awesome little pumpkin muffins and he he would have thought it was like uh, like filet mignon like the way he looked at us you know and he <laughs> could not get enough of these pumpkin muffins it was so funny um so yeah he, he'll he'll surprise us every once in a while of course he, <laughs> he loves his jerky you know and he and he likes um you know he likes anything with a good crunch he loves almonds and stuff like that it's he's, this is a dog after my own heart. A donut eating, pumpkin <laughs> muffin dog, eating dog. I need to meet this dog. This is the dog for me. I know he's yours, but I kind of want him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's full of surprises. <laughs> yeah, me and Fred have a lot of similarities. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> like snaps, that's yeah. good. I mean, I can't speak for you, Chief, but I also love a good nap. So I have listen. I haven't graduated to goat milk yet, so uh, I got. <laughs> <laughs> Snacks and naps, what more could you need? (laughs) Well, as a reminder for our viewers, it matters where you shop and Second Chances is available at shopmyexchange.com. Craig, where can viewers go to follow you and find out more about you and Fred? uh, That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, It's um, his social media, his Instagram, Facebook, Twitter is all Fred the Afghan. Uh, we've got a, a really enthusiastic uh, following of people all over, from all over the world that love that love Fred. Um, I'm so proud of that. And uh, our website is fredtheafghan.com, uh, and we have you know lots of great pictures up there and links to different videos and stuff that we've we've made. And, and we sell Fred. Uh, we we cool, have a cool line of Semper Fred. Um, oh, that, yes. oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, dog leashes and collars, and, and of course we we uh, we pick a different nonprofit every month. Um, to support uh, through through a portion of, of what we make every month through the sale of, of Fred inspired uh, merch, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so that's 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 where we're at. We're we're easy to find. If anybody has a question that you know maybe they didn't want to say in the feed or anything like that, you know, shoot us that we have a contact form on our website, and that goes that goes right to us. I'm happy happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Oh, that's kind of you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely, Semper Fred, man. Not yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm always remember that. So, <laughs> but uh, Craig, man, thank you so much. And and even Fred, I know you, Fred's been asleep the whole time, but that's okay. We yeah. we love him too. But uh, th- we thank, have that effect thank- on people, don't we? Oh, <laughs> we do. <gasps> there he is. Hi, Fred. What's up, Fred? Sleepy boy. Yeah. Oh, Fred. Hey, you want to show him a hat? Yeah, show him a hat. There you go. Oh, oh, look at him. oh my gosh, I want him. <laughs> oh, he's so tired. Can we go outside? And then he'll wake up for that. He'll wake up. Yeah. He, he's waiting on the UPS man to, to ring he, the door. Yeah. Take some treats. He knows now when he sees that brown truck, he's going to get some biscuits. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so, Craig, man, we, we want to thank you and Fred for, for sharing some time with us today. Uh, we I appreciate will we appreciate the incredible work you're doing uh, to the, for those that need it the most. Uh, you you've continued to serve even outside of the uniform, so we definitely appreciate you for that. Um, and having us with this means so much to our airmen, our soldiers, to guardians, sailors, marines, and coast guard members. And so um, we, you definitely got uh, plenty of support here at the exchange. The military community loves you, uh, and, and keep making a difference. Oh man, that. That means that means a lot to me. Um, thank you. It, I feel it. I feel the support. I feel the love, and and uh, I'm really proud to continue to to serve and and uh, to to you know do my do my part. That's all. That's all we can all do, right? 
Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, uh, we wish you all the best. And as you continue to make a difference and uh, Chief Chat out. Chief Chat out. Bye y'all.